Good morning, everybody. Um, I am thrilled. The last time I had a room this full, the topic of my talk was life's too short for long division. Um, so uh, this one's a little bit more sensible, I guess. Um, I hope it's much fun. Um, I'm Linda Gojek. I am currently the president of NCTM. I've been a member of NCTM since 1975. I joined when I was two years old. Um, <laughs> And in 1975, when I went to my first, I think my first regional was in Niagara Falls, New York. I can still tell you who the speaker of the very first session I went to. And she and I still exchange emails. I was just so excited. But I never in a million years dreamed that I would be standing up here. I still have to look and say, yeah, I guess I am president of NCTM. So um, I, am, I am just totally honored to be here. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background so you know where the presentation is coming from. I spent 28 years teaching. Started in a fifth grade self-contained classroom. Math was my favorite thing to teach, and unfortunately, reading was my least favorite thing to teach. Um, so all the parents wanted me to have their kids for math, but none of them wanted me to have their kids for reading. Um, went to Kent State University, got my master's degree as an elementary math specialist, actually a K-8 math specialist, maybe the first in the country, because when I got that degree, nobody had ever heard of an elementary math specialist. I couldn't get a job anywhere teaching only math. And finally got um, a job in a good private school in the Cleveland area, um, teaching middle school math and working with all of the teachers K to eight. Um, and what was interesting about that, that school was it gave me a lot of opportunities to do a lot of other stuff. For the last 10 years, I've been directing a professional development center at John Carroll University. And I do this stats, aha, I got one. I always have a connection to John Carroll when I talk. No matter, anybody else have a connection to John Carroll? Woohoo! Um, so I've been at John Carroll directing a professional development center. And we do a lot of work with Cleveland Public Schools and a lot of the inner ring suburbs. So my career has spanned just lots of tremendous opportunities. And every morning I get up and um, I'm just thankful for what I get to do. So since you're all here spending this beautiful day at this conference, I, I suspect that a lot of you are the same. Um, Wednesday morning, I had the opportunity to visit a school and teach a sixth grade class. And when I walked in, on the back bulletin board were the standards for mathematical practice. And at the end of the lesson, the teacher discussed with the kids what standards for mathematical practice did we use as you taught this lesson? So I suspect I have a pretty savvy audience here. But let's, let's have some fun with the standards for mathematical practice. First of all, um, <laughs> we have a problem. I actually got this um, photograph off of Google Images. All I did was Google kids sleeping in math class. And if you look at that carefully, it is a um, high school math textbook. And we do have a problem. There's something about, there's something we're missing about getting kids exciting, excited about learning, to me, what is the most exciting subject we teach. So um, I really believe that between NCTM standards documents and the Common Core, somewhere in there is hidden, to the, key, is hidden the key to helping kids change their attitudes. Not only be successful, they aren't going to be successful unless we change attitudes. Now there might be 10, 15, 20% of your kids that are very excited about coming to math. But if you're a tweeter, I'm learning how to tweet, um, just search on the word math. You'll be hard pressed to find a positive comment. I did it again yesterday. I thought I'm not gonna do NCTM 12, I'm gonna just search math. And I, was, I really wanted to get in there. Unfortunately, I need a pseudonym on Twitter that I can go in and say what I really want to say, because as president of NCTM, I have to kind of be nice. But I just wanted to get in and say to these kids, shake them up and say, it's the best subject that you learn. So we have a problem. And this is one of the problems. And this is a little bit based on Ohio. Do I have any Ohio people here? Yay! Um, our test in Ohio is called the OAA. So when you see the OAA, put in your current state test. But for most kids, and for many teachers, when we think about math, we think about basic facts, we think about drill, we think about the test, short cycle assessments, um, test prep. In Ohio, it's the Ohio Academic Content Standards. I don't know if at the high school, I'm working with a, a group of elementary schools and their coaches right now, pacing charts are huge, huge. Um, and that's what comes to mind, not only of many students, but many teachers when they think about teaching math. So I'm going to give you a little history lesson, and then we're going to take an, a look at another wordle that I think is what these documents lead us toward we ought to be thinking about when we teach math. Is anybody old enough to remember this document? 
Okay, you don't have to put your hands up. <laughs> I still have the original. And if you are interested, you can't get the document off on NCTM's website, but you can get a summary of the document. It's all there. It just doesn't look like the actual document. In the early 1980s, so do the math. In fact, I believe it was in 1980, this document came out. Okay, quick. How long ago is that? 32 years ago. Look at the eight points that were the agenda for how mathematics should be taught in this country. Problem solving should be the focus of school mathematics. Sound familiar? Uh, stringent standards of both effectiveness and it should be efficiency. Sound familiar? More mathematics for students. It's 32 years later and we're still trying to accomplish these things. That's kind of scary. So let's continue on the road of, in 1989, NCTM released the very first standards document of any content area. I remember at that time, cable television was still relatively new, and on C-SPAN, Governor Romer, Goals 2000 panel, some of you might remember that, from George I, had a panel, and little Iris Carl, who was then little tiny African-American woman, just a deer, from Texas, who was then president of NCTM, was on that panel. And I remember the governor holding up these standards, saying, we ought to have these for every subject, hour, uh, uh, every subject area. Look what NCTM has done. I was so proud. I still have that on videotape, by the way. I should probably get that transferred. It was very exciting to me as a classroom teacher to see the, the spotlight that math was in. Um, about 11 years later, Principles and Standards came out. How many of you are familiar with that document? Okay, if your hand is not up, that document is now 12 years old, and I would say it is, is every bit as pertinent today as it was when it came out. In fact, it was released here in Chicago, at the annual meeting in Chicago. You can get online access to that document at the NCTM website. And if you are not familiar with that document, it has content standards, but it also has what we call the process standards. Um, and I really believe that it is as pertinent today and as much guiding today about how we ought to be teaching mathematics. It, there's nothing in it that is contradictory with the content standards other than there may be some mathematical topics that are different grade levels or grade level bands. You can get over that. So that is still available online. And these are the process standards. So um, they are a simplified version of the standards for mathematical practice. In fact, these contributed to the standards for mathematical practice. We want kids to see not only the connections among mathematical ideas. By the way, I am going to do my very best to try to get this posted on the conference website so you can get all of the slides. I'll post them as a PDF, and that way you can access them all. And if I'm not successful, I usually ask somebody at NCTM to do it for me because I haven't been successful yet, but um, L'Oreal seems to be able to do that for me. So connections among mathematical ideas, but also connections of mathematics to real life. Um, communication, which I, I have to say that if we've come a long way in anything, I think getting kids to talk to each other about mathematics is something that we're really starting to work on and do very well. Problem solving, which I think is the umbrella of all of this. Um, reasoning and proof, which these are all really interconnected. You can't really communicate unless you're, reason, you're communicating about your reasoning. And then the idea of representation. How do we represent our mathematical ideas? How does a kindergartner represent an idea and strive to understand? And how does a high school student represent their thinking? And oftentimes, I'll tell you a true life confession, I loved mathematics until I got to Algebra 1. And when I got to Algebra 1, I hit a brick wall. Part of it was, I really believe that part of it was the way it was taught in general, and part of it was I had a very kind teacher, but I found out later that she almost wanted to be teaching. I went to the all-girls Catholic high school I went to because it was the only place she could find a job, and I decided I didn't all of a sudden become stupid in math. My mother had me tested. No, I'm kidding. Um, so uh, the big question that we ask when we're working with teachers is how do these processes impact instruction? So the processes were more about how we teach mathematics and the opportunities we give kids. And then a book called Adding It Up. And again, I'm going to ask you, how many of you are familiar with this book? OK, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it. This was the first book from the National, Academy of, um, National Academy's Press that actually dealt with mathematics, teaching, and learning in K-8. That was a big deal. National Academies is this huge science, mathematics, engineering think tank. These guys are PhDs with triple and quadruple PhDs that think about mathematics that I will never understand 
in my entire life. They came out with this book. It is available free online as a download now at that website. And if it's, the book is about this thick, and when I bought it, I paid 40 some dollars for it, and you can now get it free. And just as a test, I wondered how long it was gonna take to download it, less than a minute. They also, any book dealing with education, you do have to register at the site. Any book dealing with education, you can download free. There's another one called How People Learn. It is the most awesome book. And then there's another one about how students learn mathematics. Really good stuff. So um, that's my gift to you for Christmas or Hanukkah, to go to that website and, and dig around. If you are a primary level teacher, there's a lot of good publications there about how young children now learn math. Um, and most of you should be familiar with curriculum focal points, which was NCTM's roadmap now. Um, Kathy Seeley and Skip Fennell's big project on the, the curriculum standards were wonderful, but they weren't very specific and intentionally were not very specific about what should be taught at what grade level. And so when I was working with teachers, they were looking at those documents. We were working with those documents and they would say, that's great. Here's our three to five grade band, but what should I be doing in the third grade? So curriculum focal points was an effort to start to give some guidance as to what should go on in each grade level K to eight. I believe that that's still available. Um, at the same time, that book that I showed you, Adding It Up, in addition to the process standards, had these strands for mathematical proficiency. That we want kids, I'm gonna come back, I don't know why I put adaptive reasoning first, I think it's the most, but I'm gonna do that one last. Strategic competence, understanding a strategy for doing something. Most of my experience is K-5, so you guys that are high school teachers, I want you to think about what I'm describing using an elementary example, um, thinking about what you teach at high school. But how many of you get kids in your classroom and you're, you know, after you have them for a while, your comment is if they only knew their basic facts? And I hear ninth grade teachers say that, I hear sixth grade teachers say that, I hear eleventh grade teachers say that. I believe that kids really struggle with basic facts because basically what we do is give them a list to memorize and say go home and memorize them. And most kids today don't have a mom like I had where we sat on the couch every night and practiced them. I also believe that kids don't rotely memorize anymore, and I'm not sure that even rotely memorizing facts is a good thing. I want kids, if they don't know what nine plus eight is, to be able to think about, I take one off the eight, put it on the nine, now I have 10 plus seven, and that's easy. And I actually had a third, uh, a niece in third grade, she's now in college, so this was a while ago, where she count, came home with an assignment like that, and when she had nine plus eight, she started counting on her fingers. Of course, I said, Megan, you're in third grade, you're too old to be counting on your, a parent or a, an aunt who teaches math is probably a kid's worst nightmare. <laughs> but I asked her a brilliant question and I didn't realize it was brilliant until I saw what she did. And I said, what do you know about nine plus eight that could help you to figure out the answer? She looked at me and said, 17. I said, what did you do? She said, exactly what I just said. Took one off the eight, put it on the nine, made it 10 plus seven. Why don't we teach kids those kind of strategies? Why aren't we asking them to think in those kinds of ways? Um, conceptual understanding. There was a, an interesting article. Um, how many of you get summing, um, what's it called? Smart briefs from NCTM? You don't have to be an NCTM member. If you are not an NCTM member, you can still go to the NCTM website and sign up for smart briefs. Every day, you might get them from ASCD. ASCD has them as well. Every day around 12.30 in the afternoon, I get this little email that's smart briefs, NCTM smart briefs. We don't put them together. There's a company that does. And there are articles from all over the country about things that are going on in mathematics classes or mathematics education. And there was an article last week um, written by somebody who was a second career high school math teacher and he was talking about how it wasn't important for kids to understand. And my blood just boiled as I read it. And I haven't had time to respond to that, but I think the next president's column is going to deal with that again. That idea of conceptual understanding is the underpinning of getting kids to know and be able to do mathematics. Because I taught middle school to know well enough that by middle school, when we teach them tricks, they have this bag of tricks. And when they go to take the test, they're trying to figure out which trick am I using for this particular... And, it, and, and that grows. And then we wonder why, the, the kids are so confused, and then we wonder why they hate mathematics, because it's a bunch of tricks, and I can't remember all the tricks. That conceptual under, everything in math works for a reason, except for maybe trapezoids. Um, <laughs> but everything in math really does work for a reason. And helping kids to understand that reason is so critically important, and I hope that's some of what you're getting out of being at that conference. Productive dispositions. You know, by seventh and eighth grade, kids really start hating math. 
little kids really do tend to like math. Kind of fun. When they get to long division, <laughs> some of them start to get turned off. Fractions are no help either. It's because we're teaching kids all these things and they have no concept. Divide, multiply, subtract, bring down. And there's a, an acronym that goes with that as well. Makes no sense to the kids. They have no sense of what's going on or what division means. Uh, procedural fluency. If you didn't read the president's column on what does it mean to be fluent, it is more than just being fast and accurate. You can't be fast and accurate and make any sense out of that if you don't understand why it works the way it does. So procedural fluency means not only knowing how to do the procedure, but having some underpinning of, under, of understanding. Now I want to go back to adaptive reasoning. And my definition of adaptive reasoning is a little bit different than the one in adding it up. So when I was in the classroom, I taught kids and I, thought, I taught them well. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples when I get into the more of the example part of the talk. But it seemed when it was time to take the big test. All that stuff I thought the kids knew, they didn't seem to know anymore. And then it dawned on me, it wasn't that they didn't know it anymore, they didn't know it in the context it was given in the test. So they couldn't take the reasoning that they had from what we were doing in class and apply it in a different situation. And to me, that's what adaptive reasoning is all about. So if you don't have a deeper understanding, you might be able to do something. You might even be able to recognize once in a while when I do it in a particular story problem. But the idea of being able to take that idea and adapt my understanding so I can apply it in a different context is really important. And that can start as early as kindergarten, first and second grade, if we have the materials to help us do that with kids. Because there is no way that all of us can teach everything we have to teach and develop our own lessons and write our own things. I mean, we really have to depend on the materials that are out there to be supportive of the work that we need to do. So um, high school teachers, um, about two or three years ago, NCTM decided we had the curriculum focal points. And it was time to look at something like that at high school. But high school is kind of a different, different monster. So it's not quite as simple as what do you teach at first grade and what do you teach at second grade. So the focus on, high, uh, focus on reasoning and sense making for high school came out. And there are a series of books. Um, I will tell you, even if you teach middle school, I think that these would be very helpful. The green one, any teacher K through 12 could read. It does such a nice job of talking about what reasoning and sense making looks like in the mathematics classroom. And I believe, paid political announcement here, these are all available in the bookstore. So even if you haven't seen them, go take a look at them. Um, and then along came, so we have all of these documents. That's a history lesson. History lesson's not o now over. Then came the Common Core State Standards. Not perfect by a long shot. Not NCTM standards. I got an email from somebody that said, I don't understand why if we all have to teach these standards, we have to pay for them. Well, if you go to buy principles and standards, you still have to pay for the book. You can download it free online. And so I realized she wasn't talking about NCTM standards. But since NCTM had always done the standards, people assume that they're NCTM standards. Common Core is available at corestandards.org. Download it for free. PDF, and when I wrote back, I got a response in great big capital letters that said, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so um, they are not NCTM standards. NCTM had some input, but they were not written by NCTM. Um, they are not our standards. Are there problems with the standards? There are some tweaking. And, and you know what? We aren't going to be able to locate those problems and really point out those problems until we've taken a, a shot at teaching them. So I have second grade teachers and first grade teachers that say to me, money isn't even mentioned in the Common Core until second grade. Well, if you know anything about teaching kindergarten and first grade, coins and m counting money is a big part of their curriculum. So I email Bill McCollum, one of the authors of the Common Core, and I say, why isn't money mentioned until second grade? And he said, because money is a context, not a concept. And we expect that when kids come to school, they will already be able to recognize coins and count them. And I said, what country are you going sending kids to school in? <laughs> so, you know, and I think those are the things we need to look at and help teachers with. And if you look at the progressions documents, um, if you're not familiar with them, Google is my best friend. Common Core progressions, and they'll take you right to those documents. They do a much better job of explaining and describing how a topic progresses over grade bands. So we have these standards for mathematical practice. Um, and the reason I gave you the history lesson is why I am so enamored with the standards for mathematical practices. They come from NCTM's process standards and those strands for mathematical proficiency. It says that right in the introduction of the document. And in my mind, if we can sort out what we teach, that's not the big issue. The big issue to me is how we teach it. How do we start changing kids' 
um, understandings of mathematics and their, their disposition toward mathematics. So there they are. If you're not familiar with them, you can go online and get them. Um, NCTM has actually, I don't want to see you guys writing these all down. I think most of you are probably familiar. But there's a chart that's not carved in stone. It is really hard to take the standards for mathematical practice and align them with NCTM's process standards. This is just a, a shot at doing that. But for example, when you talk about um, constructing viable arguments, and that's put under communication, I would argue that that also belongs under reasoning and proof. So it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence going on here, but I want you to see that there's a strong connection between the two. There is one major difference, and that is in the introduction. These are not practices that we, we well, we do want to integrate them in our teaching, but these are the habits of mind that we want kids to have by the time they're finished with high school. So kids are able to make sense of problems. They can look at something, and if they have no clue what to do, they can start to think about how can I get started on this? What, can I, what do I know that I can use to help me figure out what I don't know? So these are the habit. I love the word habits of mind. This is what we want mathematically proficient students to be able to do. So as we plan lessons, we have to think about how are we going to get kids to do that in our classes? And I saw sixth graders after the lesson talk about, well, we constructed arguments and then we talked with each other critiquing the arguments of others. And I thought, do they have any clue what they're talking about? Because that's exactly what they did. So that teacher made it very explicit in her classroom where the kids had a conversation about, well, we used, we used, we used um, what's, what's the one I'm thinking about here? They use appropriate tools strategically. I, I don't see it up there. Which one am I missing there? Second one, use appropriate, to, right there, <laughs> use appropriate tools strategically. They were using manipulatives and they were using calculators when the computation became kind of brutal and it was just more efficient to use the calculator. And they were talking about how they used tools and why they used what tools when they were, it was very cool to hear sixth graders having a conversation about stuff that I as an adult have had to read these about 25 times to figure out what the heck they're talking about. I did this with a fourth grade uh, group of fourth grade teachers. We were going over the standards for mathematical practice and I was saying, just underline what makes sense to you or that seems familiar or highlight it. And by the time they got to number four, one of the teachers put her head down and I said, what's wrong? And she said, I have a headache. <laughs> so, so if you remember, I, I opened with this. This is where we want to move. Kids thinking and teaching thinking too. Fluency, number sense, strategic thinking, problem solving. Now the mathematics classroom starts to become alive. So let's look at some examples. I'm going to skip, oh, all right, I, before I skip the talking one and we get to the, doing some math, I really and truly believe that every kid ought to believe that everything they do in math should make sense. And I think that ought to be a banner hung in every classroom. Everything you do in math should make sense. And it is our jobs as teachers to help them make sense by asking appropriate questions and move away from trying to get them to make sense out of what makes sense to us. Does that make sense? <laughs> and by the way, that's probably the worst question you can ask a kid is, does that make sense? What are they going to say? No. You know, I mean, they don't know if, if it makes sense or not until it really makes sense. So um, I really, this came from an old article in the arithmetic teacher, I believe, before MTMS was even out, uh, by Jay Greenwald, and I read it and it just clicked with me. So I'll give him credit, but I think that that ought to, I think every kid ought to believe that. And I don't care if they're a second grader or if they're taking calculus. What they do in math should make sense. All right, so let's do some math. How many of you are familiar with number talks? Did anybody get to hear Sherry Parrish? I heard her room was overflowing. Um, number talks have been around for a while. They were actually started by Ruth Parker up in the state of Washington. And if you Google number talks, um, there are actually some PDF of Ruth's original work and guidelines there. So um, I'm going to give you an overview of number talks, but there's a lot more information um, on the web. And there is a book out called Number Talks. Um, it's OK. I'm not here to sell it. It's fine if you want to look at it. I don't necessarily think you have to go out and buy the book to be able to do this. What I love about number talks, well, let me tell you what they are first. It's a short talk about numbers with students. It needs to happen every day. It can be part of math. If you teach in a self-contained classroom and you got that 10 minutes before lunch and you don't know what to do with the kids, it can be done in that 10 minutes before lunch when you don't know what to do with the kids. It gives kids meaningful practice with computation. Meaningful practice with computation. That's why it's called a number talk. Can you do it with geometry and angles? Absolutely. Can you do it with some? Absolutely. But it's called a number talk because this is to be done with numbers. 
the, the goal is to help kids develop computational fluency. And the idea is to get kids to start to see and use number relationships, to make that sense out of, to get that, comp, um, that conceptual understanding rather than just saying, put down the two and carry the five. So there's six steps to a number talk. And you can, these aren't carved in stone, it's what we do. Um, the teacher presents the problem. So if you have a smart board, you can do it on a smart board. If you have a white board, you can do it on a white board. If you're like me and you're still using overhead projectors, you can do it on the overhead projector or on the blackboard. Um, and the problem can be presented in a variety of ways. And, and the problem is a naked number problem. So it's not a story problem. It's, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Students are given some time to figure out the answer. And when they have the answer, they just give a thumbs up. At least that's the procedure that this one teacher uses. And the reason is because if I've got the answer and you're still thinking and I'm waving my hand in your face, your thinking has just stopped. I, she's got the answer. So they just quietly put their hand up. Um, and then the teacher collects all the answers. What did you get? 15. What did you get? 18. What did you get? 21. And the teacher just puts the answers up on the board and doesn't make a comment about any of them. And then the kids share their thinking. So you got 15. How did you get that? And you explain your thinking. And the person that got 21 said, I think I changed my mind. I only think it's 21. So the teacher just crosses off 21 and they move on. What I love about this is the focus is on the thinking and not on the answer. So the answers become very irrelevant. You don't get a pat on the back because you said 15 and you're right. And nobody says, boy, are you dumb? You got 21 and you're wrong. And there's a bit of X next to it. It's just sharing thinking and it's convincing somebody else. It's that constructing viable arguments and critiquing the reasoning of others. The class then agrees on the real answer at the very end. And then the steps are repeated for additional problems. So I'm going to walk you through um, a number talk that I did with a group of third graders a few weeks ago. And it was the beginning of third grade, so I, wasn't, I knew that they hadn't done with much with multiplication yet. And I think the teacher was a little worried that her kids might, you know, when, you, when, this is so weird for me. When the president of NCTM is coming in the room, you want your kids to look really good. So she was really, all of the teachers have been kind of worried about prepping their kids. But this wonderful sixth grade teacher in Chicago, she said, well, what should I do to prep the kids? And I said, absolutely nothing. And so the kids were very spontaneous. But um, it was interesting to watch the teacher, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So I gave them a two-digit subtract a two-digit example, and I intentionally did not give them any regrouping. Okay? So I just wanted the kids to talk about what were the answers, and then this one was I, I learned a lot about this class because they all gave me the same answer. Explained their thinking. They had done some things on a hundreds chart. They had done some things with base 10 blocks, although they called them chains and cubes. Um, and they were able to, to really justify. And what I was so amazed at was how articulate these kids were. So they got through that one, and then I gave them this one. So the answer to the first one was 22. And everybody agreed on 22 right away. So I gave them that one. And I said, I'd really like you to think about what you did in the first one before you do this, you know, instead of recomputing for the second one. Can you guess what answers I got on that one? 23 and some kids said 21 and some kids said 23. That was really interesting when I asked them what their thinking was. Because some of the kids said, well, 55 is one bigger than 54. So my answer is going to be one bigger than it was before. And then some other kids said, but I'm taking one more away, so the answer is going to be one less. So we weren't talking about procedures at all. We were really talking about what goes on when I subtract a number. Then I thought, OK, they're ready. And I gave them that one. And the teacher and the math supervisor from the district were sitting at the desk. And I watched that teacher with a smile on her face from here to here, and her mouth half dropped. She kept saying, are my kids really saying this? Are my kids really thinking this way? So the kids had all different kinds of strategies. And none of them were cross out the seven, make it a six, and put a little one next to the other six. They all talked about reasoning what makes that true. So then I thought, after that wonderful conversation, I thought, what am I going to give them next? Now, if at any point the kids had faltered, I would have had to go back and fill in a step in between, which is the tricky part for teachers when they haven't done this before is what do I do if the kids weren't quite ready to do 76 minus 48? I probably would have backed up and given them 76 minus 46. And then maybe 76 minus 47. So they could really relate what they didn't know to what they already knew. But this was the last one I gave them. And that, again, we got into some interesting discussion because now I made the sum, the starting number, one less. What happens now? So it's very interesting and intriguing to watch little third graders talking about their understanding about this. 
And the teacher was just so proud of her kids. And the kids were really good. They were really good. You know, the same thing with basic facts. So when we're teaching multiplication facts, most kids can do their twos. They know how to double numbers. So what happens now when I want seven groups of four or seven groups of eight? So how do I build strategies? And I believe that you can build strategies from doing number talks. What happens when I'm multiplying? If kids go home and, multi and memorize multiplication facts, and they truly don't understand that seven times four means seven groups of four, when they get to multiplying fractions and decimals, they have nothing. It becomes a whole new set of rules and a whole new set of tricks. And then we wonder why they can't apply it when we give them problems to solve, because they don't really understand what's going on. Um, so here are the goals of number talks. I'm not going to go through them all again. You'll be able to download the PowerPoint. I think the important ones are, number one, the kids love them. I had a coach that was a fourth grade. Um, after coaching for a while, she decided she really missed being in the classroom. She went back to teach fourth grade. And she had kind of lost her line of seniority. So they put her in a fourth grade classroom in the worst school in the district. It wasn't really the worst school in the district, but the kids were kind of hyper. And she called her kids with love in her heart. She was an excellent teacher, her little hellions. And she said she did a number talk with those kids every day. And it was the quietest time of the day in her classroom. Those kids were so excited to come up and sit on the carpet. And she, would, and she was just such a master teacher that I just know that the way, I, I wish I, we tried to actually um, tape her, and we just never got through it. But um, she said if she, for some reason, you had a crazy day, that never happens, does it? And they didn't have time for a number talk. When the kids were leaving at the end of the day, they'd go, Ms. Mano, we didn't do a number talk today. You forgot to do a number talk today. They didn't care if they missed recess or they missed something else. We didn't do our number talk today. The kids just absolutely love them. I also want to tell you that the role of a teacher during a number talk is to do the recording, ask questions, and keep your mouth shut. The kids do the talking and the explaining. Now, the teacher can ask clarifying questions. And I believe I have some of the clarifying questions. You know, how many people did it the same way? Does anyone have any questions? I don't even explain anything. If Billy did it, then I want kids to ask questions of Billy. Don't ask questions of me. I'm not going to crawl into Billy's head and tell you what he was thinking. Let Billy tell you what he was thinking. Well, and I love it when the kids say they don't know. What is the first thing your eyes saw or your brain did? When you ask kids to explain their thinking, or how did you, how did you do that? And they go, I don't know, I just knew. Do you get that? I, I used to get that a lot. So I love that question. What was the first thing your eyes saw? What was the first thing your brain did? All right, let's move on to another concept. And again, high school teachers, your, your chore here is, because I'm more of a K-8 person, is to think about how you could do this in the, in the context of a high school concept. Show and tell addition. I remember learning addition where you were taught put down the 8, 3 plus 2, put down the 5, the answer is 56. Put down the 5, carry the 1. I don't think the kids ever knew where they were carrying the one. But to this day, when I do additions, sometimes I find myself saying, put down the five, carry the one. <laughs> so um, there's nothing very exciting about that. So I'm going to play a game. And the game is called Close to 100. Is anybody familiar with this game? OK, you guys teach early elementary then. I have um, six cards up there. And what I want you to do is to find two two-digit numbers. You can only use a card once. You can use, just say so you're going to choose four of the six. And I want you to find a sum that's close to 100. So look at those cards. Find a sum that's close to 100. And if you found one way, see if, while you're waiting, see if you can find another one. OK, who wants to share their addition problem? What'd you get? Way in the back there, talk real loud. Yeah, you. OK. No, just close to 100. Yeah. I, when I do any kind of activities with kids, no matter how old they are, I try to keep the rules as simple as possible. And I also used to give out prizes, and I stopped doing that. The prize is we're all learning. I was the queen of smelly stickers when I taught school. <laughs> Everybody got a smelly sticker if they did a good job during class. So who's got one? Anybody got one? All right, right here, but real loud so they can hear you in the back. 39 and 39 plus 62. What was your sum? Uh, 101. 101. She's pretty close to 100, isn't she? Anybody else get one close to 100? Yes, what did you get? 76 and 24. 76 plus 24. What did you get? 100. Now, as a teacher, I really 
be tempted to say, wow, you got 100. But that makes her answer a little less valuable than her answer. So I'm working really hard not to do that anymore. You got 100. Good for you. Who's got another way to do it? Yes, way in the back. 67 plus 34 gives you 101. What were your two add-ins? Um, uh, 39 and 62. Okay, so they were very different. I just wondered if, she, if you may have reversed numbers. So there's a lot of patterns that come up. Did anybody get another one? Anybody get one that was close to 100 but less than 100? Way back over there with the black shirt on. Seventy-three and twenty-four, and your total is? Is that close to a hundred? It absolutely is. One more. Sixty-three and thirty-six. Do we have that many? Now, why can't we use sixty-three and thirty-six? I, I have to use four different cards, okay? And that's all right. Now, in my early days, I would have said, don't you follow direction? Who cares? You know, you have to use different cards, so that one doesn't count. Um, yeah, you know, I think I'm just as, I think my expectations are higher than they used to be, but I think I've calmed down a lot. <laughs> I have to, you have to figure out what's important and what's not important. Um, so you can do this with three digit, you can do this with integers, you can do this with making fractions out of the cards. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do. I want you to think of how much practice, if you gave this to your students, how much practice they would be getting in addition by playing this game as opposed to sending home a page of addition problems for them to practice. Plus, there's something else going on here. They're getting a sense of place value. So they really have to think about place value. You can change it to three add-ins. You can change it to multiplication. I mean, there's just a lot of versions of this game. Multiplication. I don't know, I, don't, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the newer textbooks. But I remember when I taught, at least at the beginning, this was very similar to what I would send kids home to do. We taught it today in class. You're going to go home and practice it. I got a little smarter later on. I would pick out three or four for them to do, and they'd say, you only, we only need to do three or four. And my response was, you have to spend just as much time on those three or fours you would have if you were doing all 20, because I want you to get them right. I want you to really think about what you're doing. Still not very exciting. How about this? Putting this up on the board and asking the kids or giving it to them for a homework assignment. Um, Figure out what that is and explain to me how you got it. And I want you to do it two different ways. So what is 28 times 7? Or you could, if I wanted to, I could reverse it to 7 groups of 28. I want to do it two different ways. What are you thinking? All right, so what do you mean by decompose to 28? Um, 25s are really easy to do because of money. Okay. 25, so if I know what seven quarters are worth, I can figure that out, and then I have to do three more sevens, which is 21. I can put that together. Anybody have another way? 20 times seven and eight times seven, which is really what, I want to go back to yours in a minute, but that's what most kids will do. They'll say 20 groups of seven and then eight more groups of seven. That's the distributive property. High school teachers, wouldn't you be thrilled if they came to you and really understood the distributive property? And how many times in elementary and middle school do we teach teach them the distributive property, and they have no clue what, they're talking, what you're talking about. Let them use the distributive property. 20 times 7 plus 8 times 7 is the distributive property. And when I figure it out for myself, it actually makes sense. Does anybody have another way to do it? 30 groups of 7 minus 2 groups of 7. That's also the distributive property. Only this time it's multiplication over subtraction. I don't remember ever learning the distributive property of multiplication over subtraction until I started to play around with this. I, and by the way, after working with teachers and working with kids, I multiply very differently than when I, how I learned. In fact, I do a lot of math very differently than how I learned to do it. I had one more way in the back there. Yes? 28 times... 28 is 4 sevenths. 7 sevens is 49. I have to think about that. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that right now because there's not enough time. But that, I've, not, I've not seen that strategy before, so I have to think about that one. 
Um, and kids do that, by the way, to me too. They'll come up with one and I'll go, you know, I'm not sure I haven't seen that before, so you gotta give me a little bit of time to think about it. Which tells me that when kids share strategies, they don't have to all understand each other's strategies. They aren't gonna be able to do it. They, they hook onto a strategy that makes the most sense for them. Four times seven times seven. Oh, I gotcha. All right, so now I'm doing four groups of 49. And then I can think of four groups of 50. But so there's all kind of, thank you. See, asking you to clarify her thinking. It's a lot harder when you're standing up here doing this, by the way. To, um, I want to go back to your notion of seven quarters and then three more sevens. Um, I was working with a group of fourth grade teachers, and I had one fourth grade teacher who said, my kids would never come up with that. I said, well, that's okay, they don't have to. It's just one way of thinking about it. I happened to be in her building and walked into her classroom. This was several years ago. And it was almost like I timed it. They had a problem similar to this up on the board. And one little girl said, well, I was thinking of quarters. And that teacher looked at me like, did you set her up to do that? You know, don't sell kids short. They come up with strategies that make more sense than a lot of times what we are thinking about. Because they have this knack for connecting it to the real world. By the way, that's what makes teaching elementary and middle school so much fun. So, you know, this is the idea of growing an idea, place value. You know, looking at, this could be a number talk. Once the kids start to understand, how can I build that idea? Once I know what multiplication means, how do I do multiplication by, group, multiplication by groups of 10, and then 10 and a little bit more? You know, this could be a half a day session, but I, I'm gonna keep moving. And again, um, so, one year, I, for many years I taught fifth and sixth grade. I taught all the fifth grade, and then I got one section of sixth grade. But one year I got promoted with the fifth graders, and I taught all the sixth grade. And so I thought, oh, fifth grade was a year of fractions. We did fraction circles. We did fraction bars. We did fraction pieces. My kids knew fractions. So they got to sixth grade, and we're starting fractions. Just a quick review. And I put this on the board. By the way, I was still pretty obsessive compulsive about you have to write it this way, because if you don't write it this way, it's really hard to put the fraction on your So I asked the kids what that was. Can you guess what they said? They all said three-fifths. And I turned around and I looked at them and said, who was your math teacher last year? And they all laughed and said, you were. But I realized something. I realized something. It was probably one of those aha moments as a teacher. I had taught them how to do it. I even thought they knew why they were finding common denominators. I got to get all the pieces the same size. I didn't teach them any number sense about fractions. Why is three-fifths not a reasonable answer? I want kids to look at that. Why is three-fifths not a reasonable answer? I heard somebody over here. It's less than one. How do you know the answer's got to be more than one? I have a half, and I'm adding more than a half. So my sum's got to be more than a whole. Anybody else? How do you know three-fifths is not a reasonable answer? When I asked the kids that, then the, then the conversation and the thinking started. It taught me a whole lot about, even if I think they conceptually understand, if they don't have number sense about it, changed the whole way I thought about fractions and the way I taught fractions. Then we got this one. And I don't know about your books, but my, our textbooks always had, you take the five apart and you make it four and, and five-fifths. So you have four and five-fifths minus two and three-fifths. And two weeks later, when you give it to the kids, you give them a problem like this, what's their answer? Three and three-fifths. What seems to be a more reasonable way to do this? That algorithm is stupid. Why not take five minus two is three, and now I have to take off another three-fifths? Why am I taking this number apart and making this outrageous fraction out of it, which I can do, I can mimic and go through the motions. I understand that four and five-fifths is the same thing as five, but in two weeks I will have forgotten it. So why not give kids the opportunity to make sense out of it? Ah, here's my favorite. Ours is not to reason why, just invert and multiply. <laughs> So I did a couple of things with this. First of all, um, one of the things that's really important is when kids learn multiplication and division, it's not just procedural. That division means, I'll give you a whole number example. If I have 28 divided by 7, it means how many groups of 7 can I make out of 28? It's this idea of undoing that grouping that I did in multiplication. It's that idea of the relationship between those two operations being so important. Instead of worrying about, what number do I flip? How about, because that's what, that's what fifth graders and sixth graders think. And that's what makes me a little bit nervous about multiplication, division, and fractions coming up in the fifth grade in the Common Core. Those guys weren't in fifth grade, <laughs> I gotta tell you. That really makes me very nervous because that is a very hard concept for kids to understand, even sixth graders to understand. Fractions are really difficult for kids and their thinking about fractions is really fragile. 
And we've got to be really careful that just because the common course is to do this, that, and the other thing, that we aren't just pushing them through a different set of motions. How about if I said, I've got four fifths. I want to know how many groups of two fifths I can make out of it. How many groups of two fifths can I make if I have four fifths to start with? And I can draw a picture of that. And you know, if I see it in a worded problem, I can actually figure out. I can say to myself, well, I, I have a yard and a half of ribbon, and it, it takes me a half a, a half a yard to make a bow. How many bows can I make? I can actually picture that in my mind. And connect it to division. When I flip and multiply, I, I know why that works, by the way. I knew why that worked when I learned it in the fifth or sixth grade. But it, it had no meaning to me. I could explain to you why it worked. I knew which number to flip. I love it, because when my kids would, one year I gave this, uh, we introduced this and drew some pictures, and I sent the kids off to study hall to practice with a few examples. And the study hall monitor was the English teacher. And the kids came back, and he had shown them the shortcut way, the real way to do it, and they all flipped the wrong number. That's what happens when you have English teachers helping you, because <laughs> I'm kidding. But they, there was no sense, I mean, even as an adult, he couldn't remember. And then I love it when I would give kids uh, multiplication problems that didn't work real neatly, so they decided that if they flipped one number and divided, that worked better. So this is part of that bag of tricks I keep talking about. Um, so again, that's what kids are thinking. What, am I, what operation am I doing? Which number do I flip? The sense making and the meaning just simply isn't there. Um, and then, okay. So I want to I wanna move on to this one, and then I have some really good slides at the end, so I don't want to um, lose time. Decimals. When we teach kids to multiply decimals, middle school teachers, now we're getting into your territory. Think about integers. Do we teach them to just count up the decimal points and places in this? Or do we get them to look at that and say, I love this thing. I got this from an old pro uh, set of materials called the Lane County Mathematics Project materials. And if you can find them used on Google, they're about 200 bucks for the book, so I'm kind of treasuring mine. But this is one of the neatest things to introduce kids to decimals. My calculator works OK when I put in the two factors. But when the product comes up, there's no decimal point. Where does the decimal point go? Now I am no longer worried about counting up decimal places. That's the right answer, but I have no idea where the decimal point goes. Use what you know to figure out where does the decimal point go. Where does the decimal point go? Behind the 8? How do you know that? Because I got 7 times 4 is 28, so that's pretty reasonable. And I can even get a little closer. I have a number that's really close to, to 8 times a number that's really close to 5. So my answer should be really close to 40. Why is it less than 40? Because both numbers are less than the number that I started with. How about this one? I love this one. The first one was kind of easy. Just talk real loud. If my kids understand that that god-awful number, 0.545, which, by the way, I don't let them read it. I don't care what grade level they're at. They read that as, um, you know, I have to stop and think. I have to stop and think. 545 thousands. When they read 0.545, it's very efficient. There's no meaning there. So I want kids to look at that and know that that's about a half. And so I need about half of 534. I don't even have to figure that out. I know if half of 500 is 250. I can figure out where the decimal point goes. And you know, kids are adults are intrigued by this. Kids are really intrigued by this. They don't have to do any cumbersome multiplication. They're thinking about what the numbers mean. How about this one? It's, it's got to be around 48 because I'm dividing by a number that's really close to 1. So here's a question that really puzzles kids. Why is it less than 51? Because I know 51 divided by 1 is 51. Why is that missing factor less than 51? Because I'm making groups that are greater than 1. I'm going back to that meaning of what is division. And then finally, I love this one. What question do kids ask themselves about that? How many nickels are in $3.75? Now they have adaptive reasoning. If I think about that, as, kids can do money. If we could put everything in the context of money, our kids would be great. <laughs> they, they can do money. So even if they have to think about how many nickels are in $3.75, they at least have something to um, anchor their thinking on. So this is one of my favorite problems. Again, it deals with money, and it's very intriguing. And 6th and 7th graders love this problem. Marty, um, Marty offers his parents a new deal for his allowance. Rather than getting $5 a week, he suggests they pay him $0.01 cent for the first day, $0.02 cents the second day, $0.03 cents the third day, 
four cents. I'm sorry, it doubles. Four cents, yeah. And then it doubles to eight cents, yes. I just like to make a connection. One grain of rice. Absolutely, yeah. And there's a couple of different versions of that book. Get the one with the beautiful pictures. Um, anyway, and I love to, I do this in my classroom. I even do it when I'm working with teachers. I love to go on Google Images and find pictures that go with the problem. They just make them a little more interesting. The kids go, oh, there's Monty Hall. That's not Monty Hall. There's Howie Mandel. Um, Monty Hall, duh. Um, so, but the kid, what's really cool about this problem is the kids don't realize it, and I tell them they can use calculators. They've got to record their work, but they can use calculators. Well, their calculators run out of places really quick. So as they're recording their work, there's a lot of patterns that come up, and then you can start getting into powers of two. So this is not a one-day problem. In fact, this might be a two-night homework assignment problem. Um, don't know if you're familiar with a couple of Gary Larson's cartoons. This is one of my favorites. Guy's trying to get into the pearly gates in St. Peter's. Says, okay, now listen up. Nobody gets in here without answering the following question. A train leaves Philadelphia at 1 p.m. It is traveling at 65 miles an hour. Another train leaves Denver at 4 o'clock. Say, you need a paper and pencil? But, you know, this is how I remember algebra. And I really, I love what I do. And I love the fact that I wound up working with kindergarten through eighth grade. But there's a little part of me that feels like I was really cheated. So there's a little part of me that says, boy, I just wish I had done better in high school math. Ah, <clears throat> this is my rated X problem. It doesn't go in the classroom. Um, I have a friend that likes to go to Vegas. She's a big gambler. I am not. So when we go, we usually go free. I'm one of these people that I have my money counted out for each day. And I put it in the slot. It's my entertainment money. I can choose to go to eat. I can choose to go see a show, or I can throw it away in the slot machines. So I was throwing my last $20, and I usually pay penny slots, but I thought, oh, what the heck? I'm going to go put it in the nickel slot. I'm going to go big time nickel slot machines. And all of a sudden, all these sevens came up. I mean, I was down to my last um, 150 nickels. So what is that? $7.50, right? So as soon as this was gone, I was going to go upstairs in my room and watch American Idol or something. And this came up, and I went, I don't know what that's worth, but it looks really good, and the thing is flashing. And so I pulled out my, my um, iPhone to take a picture so Ruth could see it. And on the other side, I saw that. Now, my adrenaline, I don't win ever in Vegas. I might win a little bit, but I usually, if I go home even, it's been a successful trip. I see this on the other side. Now, normally, I could stop and think what 14,000 nickels are worth, but my adrenaline is flowing, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I think I just won a lot of money. And I, I have to say, that I didn't think that, you stupid idiot, there's a calculator on that iPhone as well. So I didn't think about that. But I kept, what came to my mind was, where does the decimal point go? <laughs> I know that 14 fives is 70, but where does the decimal point go? This is, I have actually been kind of experimenting with this problem and giving it to adults. I want you to think about how, how could you strategize what 14,000 nickels are worth? So I want everybody to think about that for a minute. It's kind of a fun problem. Not quite the lottery from the other night, but I'll take 14,000 nickels. OK, hang on one second. I want, to, I want to give everybody a chance to think for a minute. All right, you've got a strategy. You've got to say it real loud. I figure out 14,000 dimes first. 14,000 dimes would be worth what? $1,400. And so 14,000 nickels would be worth? It took me about three times doing this before somebody came up with that strategy. I personally really like that strategy. I never thought of that one. Anybody have another way to think about what are four? It's just kind of fun to think about it. Yes? I'd say there's 20 nickels in a dollar. 20 nickels in a dollar. And then, then I said there's 100 nickels in $5. 100 nickels in $5. So if I, I can now, you know, this is where, what do, how am I moving that decimal point around and what do I do with all those zeros? It becomes really kind of tricky. And if we taught, I, I mean, I learned count the zeros, move the decimal point this way and that way. When I try to do it with larger numbers, I really get lost. I really have to back up myself and force myself to think about it. Yes, one more. Same idea of 140 divided by 20 is 7. So there's two more zeros, so 700. It's a lot easier to do it when you're not winning the money. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot easier to do it. Um, so we'll end with a couple of cartoons. And then if we have time, I'll ask if there are any questions, but we're really close to the end. I love Calvin. And, um, so he leans over and he says, Psst, what's seven plus six? I love her answer. 300 billion gazillion. Oh, thanks for the big help. That's a three followed by 85 zeros. I knew that. That's no number sense. Um, why do we need to know this? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
You know, I really have to tell you that this has been the story of mathematics education up until now. You know, I have teachers that say every time we start to figure out the standards, in our case it's Ohio standards, they throw a new bunch of standards at us. And one of the things I think that's interesting, it's not perfect, but we, we have a couple of years to really get and unpack and figure out the Common Core and the standards for mathematical practice. So I hope a year from now we're not thinking about this cartoon and say we did it again. Now, that doesn't mean it's perfect. That doesn't mean the evaluation stuff is perfect. It doesn't mean the transitions to the testing is perfect. It's kind of all kind of scary stuff. But at least we have time to think about what we do in our classroom, what we have control over. And finally, I would really like to see our kids and pictures and thoughts about math class moving from this to this. Thank you all very much.